very excited to introduce our topic and our speaker today. Uh, as I mentioned, we're here to talk about, uh, you know, beginning with the end in mind in terms of creating novel uh, plant-based alternative protein products. It's a lot more, uh, as we'll hear, than just coming up with a recipe, but you need to come up, uh, you know, concoct your, your business plan and in a plan for, for producing those products at scale, which we'll hear all about from Joe Ertman. Uh, very, very excited to have Joe Ertman joining us today as our special guest. He's the president of Real Vision Foods, which is a California-based co-manufacturer uh, that focuses on the plant-based industry. And, um, you know, they have a lot of really great clients in the all-protein space already. Uh, I think he's got a very unique and thoughtful approach around co-manufacturing, around uh, incorporating biodiverse uh, ingredients, about, you know, finding creative ways to work with companies rather than just looking at things like MOQs. Um, so really excited to have Joe joining us today. Um, I think he knows he's a really, really good co-manufacturer. So excited to hear kind of all about, about that, uh, the way he thinks about things. So Joe, if you'd like to provide um, more introduction, um, you know, feel free to do so and I will share the screen and you're Great. good to go ahead and get started. Okay. Good morning, everybody. Thank you for the opportunity to visit uh... I'm some, on something near and dear to my heart and uh, certainly will be uh, kind of center stage with your progress as you uh, move forward in your commercialization um, intentions and, and goals. Uh, a little bit about Real Vision as, as uh, Nate suggested. Uh, we are a co-manufacturer based uh, actually in Rancho Cucamonga just outside of uh, uh, Ontario Airport in Southern California. We do have a, a number of platforms that we provide to clients, uh, both meat and dairy analogs. So we, uh, we ferment on site. Uh, we do uh, both chilled, frozen uh, meat analog type products, in addition to uh, healthy snack uh, versions, extruded, baked, dried, um, a variety of different forms uh, that are basically shelf stable, ready to eat. So we've got a 25,000 square foot facility and a lot going on at one time. We operate two to three systems simultaneously and we are a plant-based exclusive uh, facility. So there's no animal products. And we're also gluten-free. So a little bit about my background, uh, 14 years with General Mills, uh, great organization, worked in a variety of capacities, primarily in the operation product development, but also commercialization and engineering um, categories with the, with the mills. Spent seven years at Pepsi, worked in the bottling initially and then in the restaurant group, um, and then took a stint uh, back east. It did something in technology for several years. Uh, and then I started a company called Real, uh, Sojo Foods uh, based in Seattle, which was a frozen food co-manufacturing facility. And we did I think over the course of 11 years, nearly 200 SKUs, uh, all of which were frozen. But the, <clears throat> the co-man and co-pack business has changed in that in yesteryear, um, it may have been, I need a new flavor, I need a different sauce, I wanna substitute a different starch, um, I want a different cut on the protein. Uh, today we're really dealing with you know, technologies uh, that weren't really explored and exploited uh, 10 to 15 years ago around fermentation and the whole meat analog <clears throat> categories, many of you know, has really expanded in terms of the technology application and the resultant product improvement that showed up in the marketplace. So needless to say, it's a different role today than it was uh, in previous years. It's um, much more technically involved, and hence uh, equipment process design and scaling becomes a bigger challenge because we're really creating a runway that, um, that perhaps hasn't been created before. So a little bit of my background, a little bit of kind of where I've been and kind of how I look at this. So on the next slide, <clears throat> you know, to face reality, uh, we all start somewhere. And um, I'm sure that little image on the far left is not, uh, in some cases, too far away from where many of you 
either are or may have been at some point in the process of your food evolution and application to the market. And needless to say, there's a progression that can occur, you know, away from the home lab into more formalized uh, structures and facilities, whether it be an R&D lab, a true bench, or commercialized kitchens where you start to get some sense of what scaling from a, a half pound batch up to a 20 pound batch is gonna look like. And then obviously putting that together in some format. And then you get into um, a plant, not a kitchen, but a plant where there's utilities, there's steam, there's pressure, there's a lot of moving parts. There's an existing human infrastructure in addition to the asset profile within the facility. <clears throat> and this is the space that I'm really talking about uh, that we're operating in is, you know, how do we get to a point where we can scale and achieve the kind of economics and predictability and consistent product quality that uh, consumers are expecting. So progress does come in many forms. It takes many different paths and certainly occurs on different timelines, but needless to say, um, Metaphorically, these images will probably be a little bit of your journey map um, as you go forward. So as we talk about going forward <clears throat> and keeping the end in mind, I think uh, when I put this together, I, I wanted to kind of move beyond the tactics and some of the hand-to-hand -hand that's, that's likely in the early stages of a product and an idea's germination and ultimately transformation into something commercial. You know, it goes through a bit of a curve. <clears throat> and I think we're on that curve right now. Um, there's certainly a lot of excitement. There's a lot of technological changes and advancements and progress that really indicates, you know, we're at the very steep sides of that slope um, with the advent of AI and much of the work that's been, excuse me, been occurring around fermentation and unique proteins and alternative supply chains, uh, you know, that curve could run for a while and with a slope that's pretty steep. Uh, but the, the reality is that all innovation, and I say hype, uh, runs along this cycle. And, um, and I think it's important for all of us as we engage in a commercialization process, whether it's on the operational side or whether it's on the sales and marketing or distribution side, that at some point the hype, um, that slope is gonna change. And so you're, you're going to need to rely on the core value proposition of the product and the relationship that you've developed with your customer, whether it be a B2B or B to C or what have you, um, that evolution and that change in your business profile and how the market looks at your innovation is certainly going to reflect uh, shifts in maturity in uh, what they're seeing in, in your offer. And I just, as I was putting this together this week, it's only perhaps ironic, but also timely. Uh, and I pulled a a tweet, if you look to the far right, this is from a, a buy side analyst at a hedge fund. And they made a comment, there goes beyond business model, beyond meat is what they're referring to here. I mean, impossible is cutting prices by 15%. And that's not the last cut. And so as the markets mature, and we move beyond uh, the unique, the novel, the first mover, um, competition comes about, it's inevitable. And share of stomach uh, is what you're fighting for. So we're not necessarily going to grow the eating occasion where people are going to eat more. So it's got to come from somewhere. And hence, you need to be conscious that competition is there. Pricing that you start with will not likely be the price that you continue with or that you grow with. So knowing that this curve is likely to occur and that you're going to be on it at different points of your own journey. Um, I think it's, you know, it's critical to keep that endpoint or that process in the future in mind as you start to think about scaling and commercialization, et cetera. So what is scaling? Well, I looked in Webster's or something like that. And, um, 
lots of different definitions of scale. Um, obviously, there's a zoological one that probably doesn't apply here unless, well, let's just say it probably doesn't apply here. There's an astronomical or astrological, which is all about this notion of balance around the sign Libra, which coincidentally I'm a Libra. And then there's this physical thing about balancing and weighing and all of that stuff, the scales of justice perhaps as well. And then we get into a little more of the definition that applies to us, which is this notion of succession or progression of steps or degrees. And as I showed on the original kind of photo image of the, the soup kitchen all the way to R&D labs and ultimately to a manufacturing situation, it is a process and the progression is not transactional. It's something that over time, in some cases it's a shorter time, in some cases it's years, your commercializ commercialization and operating profile and platform is gonna change to meet the needs ultimately of the product, but certainly for the consumer. So this idea of laying down markers and drawing a line for the purpose of measurement is really inherent in this idea of scaling. And obviously we're scaling up, we're not scaling down. So we want to ascend and we're getting closer to the idea of what scale means in this business situation. So as I look at scalability, I look at the, the last uh, paragraph on this page, which really tries to capture the holistic notion of what scaling is about. And it's not just about operations, it's about the whole business. And growing a business and being able to support it and to be able to move with the customer and evolve with the customer and the marketplace and the categories, and to do that in a robust way that skills, documentation, product and process definition are inherent to the way you do things. That's ultimately where scalable businesses are operating. There's SOPs and there's a rigor to really replicate what's necessary on the product or service side that you may be offering. So again, scaling is just not about cost. It's, it's a very holistic concept that encompasses much more than just co-manufacturing, but the ability to translate that benefit and that value throughout the supply chain of the product and ultimately to the consumer or end user. So that's a little bit about scaling. And if you, if you do that, um, and I kind of threw a little image in here, this is uh, uh, Williams from the Boston Red Sox from yesteryear, they did a lot of studies about his batting average, which I think his lifetime batting average was over 400% uh, percent, or over, yeah, 400%. Um, he really looked at a sweet spot and he knew where he was gonna hit. And obviously if you're a pitcher, you don't wanna be throwing in those sweet spots, but he knew what his probabilities were and that's what he went after. And scaling is a lot about improving your probabilities to hit and hit it big. So the next slide <clears throat> I wanted to capture is a little bit, um, again, these are questions. So um, I'm not here to be prescriptive or necessarily um, explicit on everything. I'm really here to kind of prompt some questions within yourselves as well as your organizations. Um, and these are questions that really are derived some from experiences that I've had with a number of clients over the years, and I've been doing this for certainly more than a couple. And I think it's important that some of these questions get thought through and flushed out. And when I look at bringing on a prospective client, these are, these are the kinds of things that I really want to understand and see if they understand. Um, because to me, it's fun to found foundational to whether the business is going to be viable. So the first one is what, what's the business you're in? You know, is it a product and or a service? In some cases, products are also going to be bundled with services as we evolve into a more digital marketplace and consuming place. Is it B2B? Are you an ingredient supplier? Are you selling to other manufacturers? Are you selling to other providers? 
excuse me, is it a private or branded uh, consumer offering? You're dealing direct to the consumer, going through conventional retail and club channels. Um, or are you really just about the technology? Are you holding the process technology and you're basically licensing? Are you saying, I've got something, you can use it a variety of different ways. Um, what, is, what is it that you, know, you really are trying to offer and sell and market? Maybe it's data. Maybe you've got a reservoir of data that you're compiling and using and ultimately bundling and packaging for sale. But I think um, this sounds obvious, but you would be surprised how many people really have not thought that through. And in many cases, they've kind of shortchanged themselves because the product may have more uh, capability and more marketplace than they even recognize. On the other hand, you can't be everything to any everybody. So there's a clear sensitivity here to also being focused. But what's important is you know what business you're going to be in and what you're going to try to do. Uh, this is the next one is is really about this notion of innovation, which is used. Innovation is like the word the. It seems to be apparent in every conversation around food and in many cases around technology. Um, you know, there are established categories in the food space, as we all know. People are eating food today. We're coming out with something new, something different. Um, is it really relevant? Is it differentiated? And really, does it provide value to the category? Uh, does it really bring something to the category that's disruptive? Or is it simply substitution? And I think it's important, and you can compete on both levels, but I think it's important early to understand how the marketplace is gonna look at what you're offering. Is it a substitution? Is it really an innovation that's gonna drive trial and frequency? Will it grow the category? Will it bring more users in? And so, Again, very simple question. And again, we use the word innovation quite loosely, but it's only innovative in the sense of whether, whether it adds value to the user. And that differentiated value proposition is really, really critical to fine tune and to flush out early. Because I've also told clients um, that the relationship that they're considering with a co-man, at least in maybe in my case, may not be the right fit because that vision or that articulation of differentiation and value really is quite fuzzy. And the likelihood of that translating to success in the marketplace, particularly now, is not high. So an important question to flush out. The third item here deals with this notion of a dynamic plan. And I use the word dynamic very specifically because a lot of plans are put together some cases they're there for the purpose of getting funding, communication, public relations, you know, gaining an organization. Uh, the plans should not be static. They should be clearly dynamic, moving, changing, adjusting. And you're looking on multiple levels here from the organization to the funding and cash flow realities. Um, the marketplace is changing, consumer expectations are changing. One wouldn't have expected and planned and anticipated what happened last year. And now the marketplace is adjusting and will continue to adjust as we move forward. There's always new technologies. There's new ingredients. There's new supply chains. What about CapEx? You know, where does that fit in your profile? Is it, if you're your own producer, if you're a co-man situation, Again, we're not dealing with sauces and changes in starches. We're dealing with a more complicated evolution on many of these, uh, both dairy and meat analog applications. And then probably one of the things that I think is understated is a realistic time series of how this is going to actually happen. And we all put forth, I'm sure, um, quite optimistic plans of how things are going to come together. And I can speak personally 
unfortunately, I'm not the only one that's doing the work. There's a lot of other parties that are interconnected. There's contractors, there's deliveries, there's development time, there's results, testing. And I think the time frame uh, definition and the scope of that and understanding what's realistic uh, is important early because it's going to dictate a lot of other actions, certainly going to dictate your funding and cash flow dimension. And it may affect how you bring people into the organization as well. And then the last item here is when people come to me, um, they really haven't dug deep into what's going on with the formulation, what's going on with their processing of their proposed product. They, they're not looking at it necessarily analytically. And I think it's really, really important that that mindset, that analytical attention be, uh, that muscle really be developed early in your product development process so that it can be translated into an industrial setting. And, um, you know, just in the last year, I've had two separate clients uh, that came in and they had a particular methodology that was quite honestly circa 1970s uh, that had no likelihood of translation into a scalable application in the year 2021. And we really had to reconfigure not just the process, but the formula to support the scale intentions of the product. So understanding what's actually happening with the product um, is really a starting point to defining what's gonna be necessary for us or anyone else to actually make it, excuse me, and make it at scale in some, at some level that can achieve the unit cost and product consistency that you're striving for. So, whether you have those skills yourselves or you hire for it or you, you know, pro bono it, whatever it is that you have to do to acquire that understanding and knowledge as a founder or even as an investor, I think it's important that you realize that the group that you're investing in really understands their product, they understand their business value um, that they're bringing to the marketplace, they truly understand how they're differentiated and where they're competing. I mean, this is a this is not a one dimensional question. There's a lot of features to it. But again, I asked some obvious questions here that get answered, I think, partially and perhaps not as in, de in depth or in detailed fashion that could be early on in the process. So let's uh, talk a little bit about uh, manufacturing, which is my principal responsibility to the sequence. And some of the things to to have in hand, I think, as you engage a manufacturing and operational partner um, as you move forward in your own process. And I showed the little icon in the, the upper right. Um, there's a lot of assumptions that are made, but gosh, there's a lot of reality underneath that. And there's always that surface tension between reality and what we assume and you know, we want to lower that water level so that we can see more of what is, not just what we think to be there. So as a general kind of thinking thought of how you approach things, realize that there's there's a lot below some of the specifications, some of the ideas, some of the discussions that really need to be dug into uh, as you think about commercialization. So I talk about supply chain. Um, specification, C of A, supplier process validation, uh, all of that is ultimately going to be germane to, uh, to bringing your product to market. Considering the method of production, is there incremental equipment needed? Has it been tested with the formula? Or are you testing on basically the stove? Uh, have you taken parts of your process and run it through a particular type of equipment? Maybe it's an emulsifier, maybe it's a deaerator. Uh, what happens when you freeze? What happens to temperature curves under different conditions? I mean, these are the things ultimately technical people should be sorting through. Is the 
individual unit operation capability, and this is as you get into Coman or even if you're doing a self-manufacturing uh, format, you have to have balance within your unit operations. If, if you're going to put together a system to get the, the level of economies that are gonna be necessary, you really have to think holistically all the way through the system. Can I maintain an instantaneous production rate that's going to deliver the scaling features on fixed cost and direct and indirect variable. And so often we'll put a piece of equipment in and it'll have huge capacity in terms of pounds. And we'll put and we'll bundle that with other equipment that doesn't. So there's inconsistencies in the flow, then you end up replicating multiple pieces of equipment to, to bring about this balance. So the thinking that goes into how the system is set up and the pounds and the quality attribute features that are necessary to deliver from each of those unit operations have to be in balance for you to reach the kind of optimal economies you're striving for. And I think it's important as well, that as you, as you get into this and engage other parties that you understand what's really driving the cost of your product as you engage a third party or even yourselves, is it really gonna be labor and throughput driven or is it gonna be fundamentally about ingredients? Perhaps it's even packaging. You know, you're gonna see 20 and 30% of your COGS products show up as, you know, packaging materials and unique films. Um, these are all features that in the end of that curve that I showed early on, as we evolve past the hype, uh, those those elements are going to show their head and they're going to be noticeable to how your business is performing and ultimately your profitability. The next item talks about food safety. Needless to say, um, you know, it's a requirement. It's not a want. It's a must. Um, as we're dealing with, you know, for example, dairy analogs, it's not just about pathogenic risk. It's also about other toxicity factors associated with cooling curves and how fast or slow you're cooling and are you generating toxicity in the product. With, a, with many uh, uh, plant-based items, you have this cooling feature that um, is not uh, principal in many animal proteins, but is in plant proteins around toxicity, aflatoxin generation, et cetera. So there's it's a big part of ensuring that your business is going to have the robustness and stability to be able to withstand the distribution system as it goes forward into the, the marketplace. There are process authorities um, th that can answer a lot of those technical questions, um, but certainly you want to have a good grasp on the risk factors associated with the ingredients you're handling and the method of production that you or your partner are proposing. Product variability, this gets into kind of product quality. Uh, you know, specifications are have purpose. And if you talk about SOPs and scalability factors, as we, as we, as I mentioned earlier around the definition around scalability, really understanding variance um, in what you would expect to see off the system. And uh, I've lived a lot of personal examples where variability is much greater than expected. Um, and system design elements didn't necessarily consider uh, what ultimately is gonna happen in the marketplace and how that's gonna expand out to different user experiences with the product, whether it's weight, temperature, whatever the particular dimension may be. Uh, understanding the variance is gonna be part of the equation and, and what can be accepted and what can be delivered. And then lastly, we talk about resources. You know, there's a lot of testing, there's a lot of reading and repeating and documenting, you know, how do you leverage the assets to get at some of these answers that I'm kind of throwing up here in questions. Um, you know, the more robust, my view is the more robust you are, the more effective your partner can be. And they will rise to your level of expectation. So, engaging the proper resources to get at some of these details and the depth of knowledge that I think is necessary to be successful um, is a critical feature to, to your plan, or hopefully it will be. 
some considerations on a client co-man um, uh, relationship. Um, obviously, what, what are the physical plant capabilities? What are the product process platforms and utility capacities? What are the products that they make today? Do they make like products or is this taking, uh, taking on a new venture, a new system, a new technology? Allergens, uh, needless to say, it's important to know what people are bringing in the plant, what their expectations are. We're, we happen to be a gluten-free facility. Uh, you know, I've operated facilities that, that we've made gluten-free products, but we've also had gluten in the facility. That's not what we do today. We've just taken that off the risk um, table. Uh, but certainly if you've got to, uh, you know, dust and flowers and so forth uh, in the building, uh, eventually that finds its way into your product if you're a gluten-free type product. So understanding the allergen profile of the facility is important. Third-party auditing, again, that's a must. Um, and there's a lot of, you know, certain a lot of literature and what's involved with that process. The one thing I would uh, mention here as well is around who does the development of the plant systems? Is it plant personnel? Is it a consultant? Is it somebody that comes in once a week? Um, you really want to see a partner that has that expertise in house. This is again, a living, breathing system that changes over time. It's not something where a seagull comes in and drops and takes off via consult consultant. I really, I really feel strongly about having expertise grounded, focused toward the system, toward the product. And so asking, asking questions about who's developing their quality and food safety systems, I think is important in your evaluation for co-man partners. Organization, who does what, background, roles on the team. Um, I think that's also uh, indicative of what priorities are for the organization and and how that fits what you you want to do with your products. Regulatory status, there's a lot of different, uh, believe it or not, there's a lot of different regulatory elements. Um, obviously, FDA food is the lion's share of what we're probably speaking of here, but there's also over-the-counter applications, um, supplement, uh, and even EPA, which is kind of a non-food category. Um, but it's important to understand what regulatory status they have in the facility and, and how they manage that. Um, is there product commercialization history with new technologies and process applications? Have they done these kinds of things before? Uh, important to take a look and understand their history. Who's responsible for proper equipment and installation, activation, food, stay, food and standard attainment? I mean, what is the, what does the accountability tree look like? You know, many co-mans are smaller and, you know, resources are finite and it doesn't mean you can't multi-process, but it's very, very important to have accountability established because ultimately it's going to be in their hands for your product. And then lastly, how does the company go about costing? What are the incentives associated with product quality, meeting service standards, unit cost reduction, et cetera? And this gets into the contractual structures between the relationship, but, um, I think you know one of the conversations that uh, I always await is how do you cost a product? How do you allocate over to, uh, overhead? Um, you know what is how does minimum order quantities factor into that? Uh, what about upside? Do you, are you full suite? Do you handle purchasing? Do you carry inventory? Uh, how do we account for working capital time changes, etc.? So the, again, these are some of the questions that one would you know, contemplate, engage with a potential co-man. So lastly, you know, the future is truly here. It's, it's right now. Um, and we have the ability, to, I think, to participate in, and develop a food system that, that can be and demonstrate sustainability and, and provide economic accessibility for all of us. It's not about the 11% that are buying premium products. It's about a it really altering the landscape uh, and providing a scalable solution to all of us. And um, in some part, that's probably your, your reason for being, and that's why you're on the call today. So little, uh, little adage here from the past, uh, 
quite distant past, it's a lot of things are going to happen. And uh, it's certainly going to feel uncomfortable and um, challenging at times, but, uh, but how you react is really what matters going forward. So let me know how I can help. We can open it up for questions. Uh, appreciate your attention uh, so far. Thank you. All right, wonderful, Joe, that, that was great. Um, and you had one comment in the chat, which is the highest, uh, highest compliment a presenter can receive. You sound like Jim Nance. Um, so congratulations. <laughs> um, awesome, so uh, everyone feel free to put your questions in the Q&A. We already have a few, so I will dive into those. And I have some other questions as well. The first uh, question, Joe, is, about uh, mycelium. I don't know if you have any experience working with mycelium. I know, I know that you do some work in fermentation, uh, but the question is, you know, how, once you have an idea, if you have any product development tips, so, you know, you could apply it to fermentation or mycelium if you can, if not just like any kind of product development tips that, that you have. Uh, uh, is, is, uh, is the question specific to that raw material? Yeah, I mean, the, the question was about mycelium, uh, but okay. I know that's a niche area. Um, you know, that's not necessarily uh, an area that I'm very deep on in terms of being offered that kind of guidance. Um, we, I have engaged several mushroom related products um, as they uh, hope to transform into meat analog um, featured uh, offers. Uh, but I don't really have depth of knowledge to be able to share anything specifically. Uh, I certainly have some product development groups that I can kind of refer someone to if they if they want to true you know PhD level expertise on that particular ingredient. Okay, so let's maybe leave leave that and just talk more generally. Um, so say you don't necessarily have access to a commercial facility, um, how how can you go about testing uh, you know formulations that are going to work well at scale, uh, maybe like even at home? Yeah. Um... You know, there's a fair amount, if you look in the university systems, wherever you may be, uh, we've got Cal Poly here, we've got Chapman University in Southern California, we've got um, uh, University of California, Pomona, uh, a number of them have some basic food processing function equipment uh, within their food science arena. And in many cases, you can actually rent by the hour, by the day, and you can engage either graduate students or in some cases, professors um, on how to utilize some of this equipment for your particular application. Uh, you can at least start an engagement with some technical resources that are gonna offer you, you know, call it zero to six on the scale of one to 10 to get moving. Um, and perhaps see some functionality out of different options that they may provide within their facility. Um, you know, you always can go to the quite pricey product development centers that exist all over the place. And it's, a, you know, it's a commercial enterprise. They will tend to, you know, develop a pretty significant scope and you're looking at, you know, five figures really to get something moving at that level. But there, there is a lot, um, uh, within IFT, International uh, Food Technologists Association, in terms of referrals. I think the universities have physical assets, assets that you can utilize as well. Um, and I, I, wouldn't be, I wouldn't be afraid as well to talk to potential co-mans about what they can do uh, on a small scale, purely as a product development uh, scope, um, to do it in a cost-effective way. Okay, thank you. And, and we had another question, and I think it's you might have just kind of answered it, but if there's anything else to add. So say you need food science expertise and you're early on, uh, any of those or any additional kind of sources for that kind of expertise you would recommend, or are there any that you think are, are maybe the best generally? Mm, well, in the in the plant-based space, uh, you know, it's interesting in, in a lot of, in IFT, which is the largest, I think, food technologist or product development, you know, trade organization in the world. They're based in Chicago. Uh, you know, they have a very large database. Their membership fee is very nominal. Um, it's a great intro into accessing, accessing those type of uh, skills uh, within the community. As you get into the more sophisticated 
uh, fermentation and analog type work, um, that's going to reside in some specific companies or specific individual consultants that may have done work in that area in the past, or some of the product development houses that exist nationwide. If it's very, very specific and tends to be you know, detailed and, and more recent in terms of technology adoption around fermentation, for example, uh, those are going to be a little bit more specific and will be a smaller audience to access for resources. But IFT is a very cost-effective way to get into that uh, ecosphere. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, next question here is, uh, have you noticed any kind of common threads among your most successful uh, companies that you work with? Um, the, the most immediate... Uh, it's almost kind of a visceral reaction to that question is yes. And, and it's the, it's the awareness, the consciousness and the commitment to think about the end state at the beginning and to not be enthralled with the idea, um, but really to fast forward oneself into the commercial realities of selling, marketing, and repeat selling your product in the marketplace. And I don't think enough founders really understand or appreciate what that means. Um, but the marketplace is pretty brutal. And um, as Beyond Meat and some of these other even large public companies are certainly learning Things change, value propositions shift, and you have to be ready and anticipatory for the likelihood of a different arena come one to two years down the road. And I think, and I have a client right now, and I was just on a live, you know, commercialization activity yesterday, and he was thinking about the cost of manufacturing. And this is virtually day one. And he was thinking about if I if I mill using this method versus that method, you know, what's the total cost effect from an operational perspective, from a yield perspective, from a sanitation perspective? He's thinking in those terms. That tells me that he's conscious about where he's going to be in the market on price and how to manage expectations and deliverance of value against that. So that probably is the most important feature that I look at when I look at a new candidate or a new prospective customer is that they're really thinking down the road and do they have, secondarily, do they have the technical depth and competence or do they know how to access it or a plan of access to guide them in these early stages of commercialization. That's what I would, that's Great. what I would say. Yeah, thank you. Um, so, you know, there's a lot of companies that are early on trying to get co-manufacturers to work with them. So from your perspective, what do you, you know, maybe things that we haven't already discussed, but are there any like specific things that you look for um, when evaluating whether you wanna, you know, undertake that relationship? Yeah, I think, um, as I mentioned on some of the early questions uh, in the presentation, um, you know, if someone's asking me in the first hour of the meeting, what's your MOQ, um, that is not the, that's not the topic that I'm dealing with here. You know, when I'm looking at a prospective customer, I want to know that they understand their business and they understand what they're trying to accomplish and they've got a plan and they've thought through, obviously not everything, but they've, they've thought through many of the issues that they're gonna face and they have a sense or a vision of how they're gonna attract the resources and pull what's necessary to accomplish that. And I'm providing one particular solution set to that, to that uh, situation. But I, I, wanna, I wanna see people that have really committed themselves to this notion of scalability, which is really putting together the resources to be able to grow, grow effectively, move with the marketplace, understand, understanding cost sensitivities. And because everybody's got the best product, nobody comes in and says, hey, this isn't a great product. They, 
it's all the best product. So somehow the marketplace is going to tell you where you fit in that hierarchy at some point. So I want to partner because my engagements take a lot of time. It takes a lot of attention. Um, I have to go deep or deeper with every client to kind of move it through the, the gates. And I want to make sure they're with me. And it's not a simple buy sell relationship. It's really a commitment and engagement together to grow the business. Yeah, thank you. Um, so uh, say we've got, you know, a team that is, has evidence of product market fit and, um, you know, they maybe have a formulation, uh, at, you know, home scale or whatever. Um, do they need to be approaching the co-manufacturer with formulation, uh, or, you know, like the process kind of thought through, or is that something that the co-manufacturer can really like help them flush out entirely? Yeah, I, I think, I think the latter, I think the co-man should be able to, um, to offer perspective. I, I think uh, it's incumbent on the founder to, to obviously have as much knowledge and as much technical exploration flushed out. Um, depending on the co-man and what particular process operations they have within their facility, there's a lot of different ways and options and alternatives to get to the endpoint. So some, some people may come in, as a matter of fact, uh, I've got clients that came in with a particular method with equipment identified and said, this is what we want to do. And uh, that investment was eh, 250 to 300,000. And I came back and I said, let's break what this particular unit operation is into two parts. And if we do it in two parts, um, we might be able to do it with negligible capital ex expenditure. So you know, th there is an exploration, there's alternatives. Um, but to the extent that the person has thought through those kind of questions and provides at least a starting point for the engagement, I think that's all favorable. Um, formulas and process work together. So you can't develop a formula and then just throw it to a process. You've really got to do it synergistically. And that's how you're going to get to the scale level that you want. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Uh, a couple more quicker technical questions. How does, uh, you know, purchasing raw materials typically work? Is that what the co-manufacturer is going to do or the client? And then how does that typically impact the working capital of the, the client? So uh, my particular, the way I, I'm going to speak the way I work, people work differently, but for a new company with a new product, uh, and let's say we've established identity and we're going to go into production. Um, I personally don't know how that product's going to work in the marketplace. So I am I tend to step back and say, in terms of ingredients, particularly packaging materials, you need to fund that initial investment so that we can make your product. And as that product moves through the distribution and sales process and, and production because becomes of some frequency that we can anticipate working capital needs for that particular business, we will eventually take that over. But I personally don't want to take the risk of sitting on $50,000 of materials that may not run again for six months. And so, you know, the founder or the person coming to us is re it's really incumbent on them to kind of appropriately fund the working capital for that initial stage and then in most cases i think co-mans will take over when they've got a predictable predictable working capital situation great thank you and then just quickly um who, who would own the claims on a package? So I'm guessing this is like nutritional and allergenicity claims. Is that the co-manufacturer or would that be the, the client? Like who's responsible? Yeah, ulti ultimately it's gonna be the client. So it's their package, it's their branding. Um, you know, obviously the, the co-manufacturer has to be able to deliver to those claims, but um, in, the, in the contract, uh, early stages of the contract discussion, um, there's, there's typically language and clauses relative to claims made by the founders or the brand owner. And the co-man is typically indemnified from those claims because those are maybe marketing claims. At the same time, 
we don't want to be in a position of making products that don't support those claims either. And so we would alert if something, someone's making a claim on fat or some particular health feature, uh, ultimately that's their brand, but, but we would advise them that what we're doing in our current formula may be inconsistent to that. Okay, thank you. Uh, kind of a big question here. What kind of product features uh, help, whether you just, like if you're gonna be selling through food, food service or selling through retail, is there kind of like a, a big difference uh, there from a production standpoint? Um, yeah, I mean, typically the product differences in packaging and the size of the pack out, um, you know, there could be some preparation differences, uh, ready to eat versus ready to cook. Um, it can, it can have an effect. Um, you know, we're in the midst of a product that's going into food service exclusively. It's going to be used back of house but it's designed as a ready to eat product because eventually it will fall into a direct to consumer application. So we're moving all the way to ready to eat now because we know that's where it's going. Even though the initial application, it would be cooked back of house. Okay, thanks. And a couple more good questions here to, to round us out with. Um, the first one is obviously there's a lot of uh, valuable IP that gets generated in the kind of process development, uh, you know, component of this. How does the ownership of that IP usually shake out? Um, <laughs> uh, well, it's a matter of what's negotiated in the contract. Um, and I don't think there's one answer to that. Uh, I've seen it reside on both sides of the ledger where the brand owner feels that any improvement that may be accrued within the development and scalability process or the production ongoing production process accrues to the brand owner. Um, there may be cases where the co-man says, um, hey, listen, that's my technology. And as long as you're producing with me, you're free to use it. Uh, if you choose to produce it somewhere else, then I don't want somebody learning on my back. So there's a negotiation that occurs to hopefully protect both parties for the efforts put forth in that gray area around IP. Okay, thank you. Uh, we, we had another uh, short question that popped in here. So before the last one, um, does your physical proximity to your client, does that matter? Um, that's an interesting question. Um, wow, that's kind of a stump the stars. Um, you know, my, my first reaction was no, but as I, you know, let me say this much. I, 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 I want people, I want people involved, right? And, uh, at the early stage of a relationship where we're really building the muscle and the infrastructure around the deliverance of the product or service, um, it, I think it's very powerful for the brand owner to understand how this comes about. I think it's part of the story and it's part of what the brand can be and will be. So, you know, proximity is relative these days. And obviously with the pandemic and so forth, it certainly changed the defi definition from a, you know, where do you work type of thing. Um, but I'd like to work shoulder to shoulder with my clients. I want them to understand what's happening. I want them to see it. Um, you know, we're just not a, a cell on an Excel worksheet. You know, there's people committed, exploring, learning, failing, standing up again. Um, doesn't mean you need, need to be there, you know, ad infinitum, but, uh, but if proximity is a factor in that, certainly it, you know, we can work around it. There's a lot of video options, options today. We're running a test tomorrow. We're going to do a video of the test because the client's out of the country. Uh, of course, it's feasible, um, but um, in many cases, there's real benefits to being face-to-face. -face. Yeah, yeah, and I imagine there's probably also benefits of, of being proximate to the, the target market. So yeah. um, last question here to round us out. Do you have anything that in terms of books or other resources that you would recommend that a food company founder could read to, to learn more about how this all works? 
Whoa, I was actually thinking of writing one. So, <laughs> um, yeah, there's a there's a book. I don't have it right here. It's uh, it's called Blue Ocean, and it came out. It's uh, it was authored by uh, some people out of London Business School. I want to say about six seven years ago, maybe longer. It's a very good book to uh, to kind of understand how to approach the marketplace and whether your product meets that product to market fit kind of idea. Um, because again, I'm not just making something, I'm, I'm investing in someone's business with my time, energy and know-how. So I want parties to be aware and conscious and literate of what they're gonna face in the marketplace and how to be more differentiated and relevant to the consumers. And if they are that, I will stand strong to providing what I need to do in the supply chain for that to happen. So I, I mentioned Blue Ocean because it's a book that I've read several times and it, it certainly has affected my thinking. There's another book uh, by Vern Harnish. He's a consultant out of Washington, DC. It's called Scaling Up. Uh, and I can certainly provide links for these. Um, but those are kind of two that come to mind. Um, Although I've got a library of a bunch of history books, I'm sure that plays a role in it too. Sure. Well, uh, we're at time, Joe. Thank you so much. This has just been incredibly uh, insightful. I think you will be getting a lot of LinkedIn connections after this. So thank you so much, Joe. And thank you everyone for joining. Thank you. Take care. Bye, everyone.